members, I declare the meeting open to the public online. And can I welcome members who are participating by video conferencing today, which is Colin McGrath, and thank him for doing so. Uh, and that, that helps us to maintain the social distancing um, requirements here in the room. Can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? We have one apology in today from Pat Sheehan, our mem and, and we have a full attendance otherwise. So in terms of a chairperson's business, I want to start out today by extending condolences to the families of all those impacted by the consequence of the coronavirus outbreak in Craigavon Area Hospital. I have spoke with family members this week uh, who have contracted COVID as a result of the situation in haematology. And I have to say, it is absolutely harrowing, the, the, the story that, and the fear that they are living with. And, and they have told me it has been absolute hell. And I think that is really, really concerning, very worrying for families. Um, and I, I, I want to extend best wishes on all our behalfs to all those who are battling the illness in, in that respect. I also welcome the fact that there's been a serious adverse incident in where I called um, to recognise that very difficult situation as to how this happened and also to wish the inquiry well in terms of establishing what has happened and to take steps to prevent any further spread of the virus in that, in that setting or any other type of care setting. Um, I also want to uh, indicate I have been, and I'm sure members have been receiving an awful lot of correspondence in this past number of days around the testing issue. There are serious problems emerging with testing. I think that's something that needs addressed very, very quickly um, in order to prevent the spread and also to alleviate the stress among family groups who, are, who are, uh, there's knock-on impacts with. So I welcome the fact that the Minister has said he's, he's uh, addressing that issue, and I think it does need to be absolutely addressed very, very urgently. Sure. Can, can we chat about that quickly? Yes, go ahead, Alec. Um, can, can, can we write to the Minister on that to ask him to outline what he's actually doing? Because uh, we're all getting com huge complaints about that. Yeah, I think that would be. Can we also maybe include it in that letter? Can we um, ask the Minister to clarify the position on GPs doing tests? Because I'm, I'm getting problems with that as well. So I just yeah. want that clarified. Are they allowed to do them or are they not? Or okay, thank you, Alec. Members content with that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I would be content with that. And just to you know, I've actually submitted a priority written question on the testing issue already. Um, okay. Okay, and actually, it, uh, that, that, that brings us on to another issue that I did want to raise in terms of there, there has also been. I, I attended a meeting this week with uh, uh, a person who very tragically had a, lost their child with stillbirth and struggled then to get the six week appointment, which is so crucially important in terms of the support that that woman and that family needs, but also in terms of future hope of, of having. And I think there is a, a really serious issue here in relation to GP appointments. And I think that we, we do need to consider maybe speaking with the Royal College of GPs again uh, in relation to would members be yeah, members uh, generally content on that? I, I, I'm happy with that. Uh, yeah, I, I've been getting issues about GPs not phoning people back as well. So, you know, it does need addressed. Yeah. Um, I also this week attended, and, and thanks very much to Paula for bringing the meeting to my attention, attended a meeting with Action for Children um, with uh, who have a number of young curers and who brought a number of MLAs uh, into a Zoom meeting with those young curers. I have to say, I think we were all deeply moved by the burden that those young curers carry and the struggle that they have to be recognised and supported as curers. It's an ongoing issue. I mean... Uh, we probably, as a society, all recognise that very many older people and women are providing care, but young people generally tend to be overlooked. And I suppose I would just like to make an appeal to... We're, we're very conscious that schools have all started back. I know that teachers and everybody involved in education have very, very busy schedules and lives, but I would just appeal to everyone to look around the room that's in front of you and see, could one of these young people or children be in a current situation, and is there something they could do and sometimes it's just a matter of recognising it and, and providing the open, the open door. But also in terms of the young people, and they were absolutely magnificent in the meeting, and I think they really deeply impressed us all. And I would like to say a very, very special thank you to Elizabeth, to Jermud, 
to Ben and Leah for attending that meeting and for giving us their perspective and, and giving us some suggestions. Paula, do you want to say anything about the, the meeting? No, I, thought, I thought it was absolutely excellent. They spoke so well and I think that we, we could all identify with a lot of their experiences. But um, I think that they, are, in terms of educationally, they're all doing as, as best they can. And I suppose it's another, it's going back to a point I made earlier around, you know, we need to be using these sort of virtual um, platforms to be engaging with people with used to, uh, um, lived experience because it's just so powerful when you hear it firsthand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I also just like to flag up um, a couple of, of issues. Today actually is World Suicide Prevention Day, and I think we have as a committee taken a, a, a fair degree of interest in that issue and in the issue of mental health. I suppose just to note, it's almost a year since the Protect Life 2 strategy came out. But I think it's it's very important, and also that we would extend our solidarity to people who are, are feeling under pressure to that extent, where they they feel that that things have got so bad. And you know, I think we all would like to do as much as we can in that in that regard. Monday, seventh of September, was World Duchenne Awareness Day, and members will note correspondence in the pack regarding this. It's also Organ Donation Awareness Week, and I, I am very still impressed with a very the first meeting actually. I think that Pam and I done a chair and deputy chair was with young Dahi McGowan and his family, and just just the the energy of him and the the positivity and all of that really has stayed with me to a huge degree. And I want to wish everyone in that situation well as well. Pam, do you want to say anything on that? Absolutely, and I suppose um, the the fantastic news this week coming out of the media around the. Um, transplants, uh, the record that's been set in, in Northern Ireland, I think it's incredible, that's a great encouragement and very timely for this week, organ donation week, and I just thought it was interesting that Tim Brown, uh, the uh, the chief in that department, um, when he was interviewed and was asked about the soft operating system, that it was interesting to see that he was actually not for that system, I'm not saying for or against it, but I think it's, um, it's appropriate to to raise that in the context of the biggest issue in all this is that awareness and it's not even just it's great to have your name on that organ don donor list and to carry the card but you need to have that conversation with your with your loved ones because of that that stat that also come out the 93 percent um, of families um, agree to donate um, once they know the wishes of their loved ones. I just think that's really vital in all of this, no matter what way you go with that type of campaign, that that conversation needs to be had. I think that's, it's good to raise that and highlight that and continue to do that. Absolutely, yeah, I, I totally agree with that, Pam. And I have to say, I have noticed a number of members, and, and my, I, I myself hope to take part in this wee coffee, coffee session, where people sit down with their families and talk about And that's, that's a very good way to do it at the present time with the restrictions that are out there. So I just want to say best wishes and to, to Dahi McGowan, Aumur Lishin, Agus Tatu Igyanu Ubarintak Dahi. So well done on raising awareness on that, and I think that's an issue that the committee is really, really keen on, on supporting as well. Um, finally, in terms of, of uh, my own input there just this morning, is I would like very much to welcome, and I think I speak on behalf of all of us as well, uh, the public inquiry into Muckamore Abbey Hospital, and to acknowledge and salute those families who so diligently and so stoically continued with that campaign. Um, they've been carrying huge amounts of stress and worry, and I think they are entitled to the answers that they seek. I think the system needs the answers that they seek, and I, I just want to welcome the fact that the Minister has, has called that inquiry. I know, I think nearly everyone here spoke very passionately and at length on, on Paula's motion in the Assembly, and um, I think it's, it's good that it's got, it's, got uh, it, it's now being called. I think that's very welcome. Okay. Thank you, members. Moving on then to the draft minutes. I refer you to the draft minutes at... Uh, of meeting held on the 3rd of September, which are tab 4.1 of your pack. Um, can I advise members that item 7.13 in the minutes, it was recorded that the item was noted, but in fact the committee had agreed to request a written briefing, so the minutes will be amended to reflect that, that uh, slight error. Are members content with the minutes subject to that amendment being made? Good. Members content, yeah. thank you. And there are no matters arising. So, uh, Members, I think now we will need to take a short pause in order to get our next witnesses arranged online. So I'm just taking a short pause to do that. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. So the next 
Nine agenda items, members, are statutory rules relating to international travel restrictions, and I propose that we consider those all together, if members are agreed with that. Agreed. Um, I refer members to the papers of tabs 6.14 of your pack, the clerk's memo at 6.1, and a copy of the committee's correspondence to the department following the previous briefing session on travel restrictions on the 23rd of July, and those are tab 6.5. And the reply to, the, to, to that letter is included in the table papers today at tab 6.6. .6. I can advise that a departmental official is here today to brief the committee on the SRs relating to travel restrictions. And I'd like to now welcome by video conference, Ms. Elaine Colgan, Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer, and Elaine, could you go ahead and brief the committee, please? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. I apologies, I was unable to connect via video, so I'm, I'm just dialing in on audio. Um, so, good afternoon, um, and I'm here today to brief the committee, as you mentioned, on the, the various changes that have taken place since my last briefing in July. Uh, as the committee are aware, the travel restrictions regs require those who have been outside of the common travel area in the previous 14 days to both provide contact details and to self isolate if they're not. Uh, been in, a, in an exempt country. Since my last briefing, two more formal reviews of the regulations have taken place in line with the legislative requirements, but several more amendments than that have been made. Uh, these amendments have mainly been in relation to the removal and addition of countries to the travel corridor list and an exemption from the requirement to provide information when tra transiting through Northern Ireland to reach other parts of the Republic of Ireland. Um, rather than take the amendments individually, I will summarise the changes that have taken place as a result of them collectively. Uh, and apologies, this might be slightly longer than my usual introductory remarks, but I will aim to be as succinct as possible without leaving anything out. Um, so first of all, country exemptions for self-isolation. Based on the joint biosecurity data, decisions are made locally on a weekly basis to remove or add countries to the exemption list. The underlying policy of broadly requiring self-isolation for countries with higher incidence than Northern Ireland hasn't changed. The aim is to ensure that decisions are made and published in alignment. However, this hasn't always been possible due to local factors in decision making in each region. It has taken some time for us to get into a weekly rhythm in terms of data production and analysis. Um, however, we have now uh, reached that position and broadly speaking, the majority of changes will come in on a Saturday at 4 a.m. Urgent changes will still be made outside of that if the data suggests it's needed. Uh, so travel from one part of Ireland to another via Northern Ireland. Um, I think this was previously referred to as the Donegal issue um, by, by some um, stakeholders. Uh, so the Health Committee previously raised this concern with me uh, regarding passive persons who are transiting through Northern Ireland. And technically and legally speaking, such journeys did require a passenger locator form to be completed. And whilst in practice that was unlikely to be enforced since travellers wouldn't encounter any border force staff, following concerns raised by the committee, the regulations have been amended to remove this legal requirement. The amendment was made on the 14th of August and allows persons to travel through Northern Ireland without completing a form, provided they remain in their vehicle at all times and do not take other passengers onto that vehicle. And that wording is in line with the transiting provision for travel through non-exempt countries, for example, during connecting flights. So leaving self-isolation. Regulation 4 allows people to leave self-isolation for a very limited number of reasons. Uh, and an amendment has been made to clarify that those self-isolation may leave in order to exercise alone or with other members of their household. The previous provision only allowed exercise alone, which was impractical for those who require supervision at all times, such as children. The Chief Scientific Advisor was content with this approach and it was considered an important amendment to ensure that both children and adults could avail equally of this opportunity. This regulation was also amended to clarify that a person doesn't need to self-isolate from someone who is coming to them to the place where they are self-isolating for one of the following reasons. To provide emergency assistance to them, to provide care or assistance to them or someone else in their household, to provide medical assistance or veterinary services, and to provide critical public services. So moving on to the healthcare worker sectoral exemption. Uh, the exemption for healthcare workers was removed on the 31st of July following advice from the Chief Medical Officer. Whilst previously we retained this exemption for those travelling to Northern Ireland solely to provide healthcare, it was no longer felt to be justifiable to continue with this given the risk of introduction of infection to health and social care settings. This would not prevent healthcare workers from within Northern Ireland um, to travel to exempt countries. 
We have also made an amendment to the list of specified competitions for which comp competitors are not required to self-isolate and that included two golf tournaments in Northern Ireland this month. Some minor and technical changes have been made to reflect drafting errors raised by the examiner of statutory rules in her report and also to provide some clarity and terminology used in the schedule to relating to sector exemptions. So I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have and I should also apologise, uh, Gary Maxwell asked me to pass on his apologies, he had hoped to be able to join as he kindly took over for some of the amendments while I was on leave, but uh, he has provided me with the information from those so hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions in his absence. Okay, Elian, thank you. And I'll start off just in relation to the uh, the letter that we had sent from our last meeting on the 23rd of July. We had requested further information on the risk stratification, so what the trigger points would be, for example, in certain countries. Um, now, it is disappointing to see in the reply that it refers to the, the engagement we did with the Chief Scientific Advisor, but I'm sure the Department is well aware that that issue was not discussed and therefore that information remains outstanding. So can you give us any further information in relation to how those decisions are arrived at? Apologies for that, Chair. Um, so there isn't a, a specific set of trigger points. There's a number of factors which are taken into consideration, um, and Ian would obviously be much better at explaining this and, and advising. Um, well, we get a weekly update from the Joint Biosecurity Centre which considers things such as point prevalence, uh, uh, per 100,000 of the population, how that compares to the UK at the time, uh, and also they do some analysis for those countries that are um, considered borderline in terms of the level of testing that's happening there and the positivity rates. Uh, locally, we are also now starting to consider the numbers of cases that have been referred to the contact tracing service that have come, that have um, stated that they have been travelling abroad. So that's only recently changed in the last couple of days that we've been able to do that. Um, so that's broadly how it works. Um, for more detail, I would need to get that um, evidence from Ian, but apologies, I, I had understood that had been discussed, but um, that obviously wasn't the case. Okay, thank you. And um, in relation to, we had asked a question about a range of languages, the response back that this would not be possible because it would delay deployment. But I'm just wondering, could the English language version not have been deployed and then a lot of our, and, and some of these are the most vulnerable communities to, um, to the conditions which, which, within which coronavirus and COVID-19 can spread. People from other countries, people who are working in, in food production, in domiciliary care. So I'm, I'm at a loss as to why the forms couldn't be out in English, but work ongoing to provide them as quickly as possible in the other languages. And I, and I do note that, that they're already out in Welsh, I believe, but it just you'd think that you, no one here would argue that we hold the forms until they're ready in all languages. So why can't it be done in parallel? Um, I would have to take that question back to Border Force as they're responsible for the form. However, I will say that um, the, the form, once it, it isn't just set, it is changed regularly. Uh, so we've had to change it a number of times and there is a working group also at the moment looking at how to simplify that because uh, that would obviously increase compliance if it was a lot simpler to fill in. Um, there is, a, a, there is the helpline which people can phone if they have problems filling it in and that includes if they're having problems with the language. Um, and so that people there can, can talk them through it and help them do it a bit better. Um, but at this point, I understand Border Force don't have any plans to do large-scale translation of the form. Yeah, I think that, that, that seems to me to be a very, a, a very risky thing and a very, a very dangerous thing because, I mean, communication here and engagement is part of the executive's engagement with, with all, of all of our communities. Um, so I don't know how we're engaging effectively if we're not providing key documents in in that in those languages that that some of them you know may may be their only language. So that's that's an issue I think we'll have to we'll have to give some more consideration to. I was also curious in terms of there was in F three paragraph F three brackets three paragraph one. There's a list of events that that. Uh, the, reg the restrictions don't apply to cultural, entertainment, recreational, quite an extensive list, but I'm wondering what type of gatherings would be outside of, of that list, you know, would be excluded from the list that, that was outlined. 
Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure what list you have in front of you. I'm assuming it's something from Schedule 4, which is this list of specified competitions. Would that be No, it's, it's, a, it's, it's F3, paragraph 1. Uh, the, I keep provision that uh, restrictions and gatherings shall not apply to, and I'll tell you, I'll, tell, I'll give you the list. So, shall not, the restrictions shall not apply to cultural, entertainment, recreational, outdoor sports, social, community, educational, work, legal, religious, or political purposes. So, I'm wondering what will be outside that. That's in the general um, restrictions. This is in the general restrictions now, Elian. You know, the, the, yeah. the, the general restrictions. Yeah, I'm not involved in the general restrictions regulations at all. I'm, I'm not familiar with them at all. Apologies. Okay. Well, then going back then to these restrictions, in terms of uh, the activity around these, how many fines have been issued now under these regulations? In Northern Ireland, we've had two um, fixed penalty notices which were issued towards the end of August, early September, to, to people who were not self isolating as they should have been. Okay. And. Um, is there feedback at this stage as to the effectiveness of the system, as to how robust it is, as to what level of follow-up is being completed? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, we the, the the number of calls undertaken daily between Northern Ireland and England has increased within the last week to 1,500, um, and that's been from 1,000, so that's another 50% increase. Um, we get a daily report through um, which outlines kind of generally how many calls are needed to hit to make to make contact with fifteen hundred people um, and also outlines kind of the result of those those calls and largely by and large people are compliant. Um, less sort of less than ten percent of any concerns associated with those and those are then passed for consideration by the police. Um, but again not all of those even when they're whenever the police investigate are problematic. It's just that they have been flagged by the callers. So in Northern Ireland we've had in August, from the middle of August, about 26 referrals from Border Force, and only two have led to a fixed penalty notice. Okay, okay thank you. And, and finally, then, Elaine, from me, um, we, we, we do and we did understand that it was impossible to undertake formal public consultation around these issues, given the circumstances in which they arose. Um, but I would be keen to hear if there's been any informal public engagement to gauge the public views into the effectiveness or into the working or, or improvement. Has there been any informal engagement on, no, on, that, on the re restrictions? Um, not really, no. We, we've kind of engaged with um, some stakeholders or, and just some general members of the public when they have come to us with a query, um, but we haven't um, reached out to, sort of, to do a, like a wider consultation on that. Um, no, we haven't done anything. We ha I did speak to CAJA a couple of times just with some queries that they had, um, but other than that, there hasn't been any specific bodies reached out to. Okay, thank you. And then going to members then. Any questions from members, Pam? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Elaine, for your attendance. Um, can I ask you um, if discretion can be given to organisers of funerals and wakes, why can't families be trusted then to provide um, risk assessment of reasonable role family gatherings or occasions above those 6, 15 um, person limits. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of going forward and uh, coming up to Halloween and Christmas and those um, kind of family holiday times, which are going to be very challenging. Um, yeah, again, those are the general restrictions regulations. And I understand Nigel and Liz are maybe appearing later in committee, and they'll be able to address those queries. OK. Um, could I ask you then, um, in terms of the electricity interconnector workers who have been removed from the provision of exempting certain categories of worker from quarantine, yeah, what the rationale was behind that? Um, so I think that was actually more of a, a technical correction to the wording. Um, I can follow up and confirm to that, but as far as I know, they, that was more we got some of the wording and definitions wrong. And that was one that the examiner had raised. So I'll double check and come back to the committee on that. But as far as I know, it's, there's still something there. Okay, thank you. And, and just to just to point out to members, Nigel Hill will be here later to address the more general restrictions. Just in, where where those where those overlap, uh, Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks uh, for the presentation. Um, yeah, there's obviously a lot of SR. So uh, apologies if this is 
the, la the later stuff. Um, but any, any concerns, um, Elaine? We heard yesterday in the Irish news that the data sharing from, from the South um, isn't really happening or isn't happening to the extent um, it should be. So any comments on that um, would be helpful. Um, and my understanding is a lot of sport events are exempt from the quarantine, uh, if I'm correct in reading um, the pack. Um, so my understanding is obviously there's been a reduction in the amount of people who can meet uh, outdoors. There may be. Uh, today, a possible change to uh, indoor uh, meetings and family gatherings and that. Uh, I just don't understand why uh, it seems to be that groups like uh, the Moet and Chandon July Festival Horse Racing I don't think have to quarantine, uh, but people here will obviously have to quarantine, uh, sorry, have to isolate and reduce numbers of people meeting outdoors. So I don't, I don't understand. There seems to be a contradiction in that approach to me. Uh, and also, I think we're getting obviously a lot of countries. Um, or either they're being added to the exemption list or they're being removed from it. But I think it would be very helpful to have the either the R rate of those countries or the cases per um, 100,000 because a lot of information and countries are coming in and I, 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 I'm unaware of, of the, the rate of infection in, in those countries. So I think that would be helpful. Okay, um, thanks. Um, so in terms of data sharing with the South, um, the South is I think that's most likely to be around contact tracing. I didn't see the article that you're referring to, um, but certainly for travel, we've we've always struggled with that, um, and we still um, are working with the sites to try and get uh, th those measures in place for the travel. But in terms of contact tracing, where um, where where an, a person is identified as needing to be contact traced, those two contact tracing teams, North and South, are in contact with one another and can make referrals between one another for their respective. Contact tracing team to pick up with that person, if that makes sense. So, it doesn't. It doesn't. You know, the public health um, risk is still being managed effectively by the two public health agencies. And in terms of sports exemptions, um, I'm not overly familiar with the current indoor requirements. But in terms of the sports exemptions that are there, they're they're high level um, elite athlete competitions, where the, those that compete in them generally travel around between competitions in a bubble. Uh, so there are additional requirements in place upon those in guidance um, published by DCMS in the Department of Culture, Media and Sport in England that those um, sports teams adhere to as well. Uh, and they're generally they're tested a lot more frequently as well. So there are other measures in place to mitigate the risk, but it is largely under the assumption that they are travelling around to elite events in bubbles uh, rather than mixing with the local population as such. Um, and in terms of the third query uh, on the country R rate and the cases per 100,000, uh, if the data was to be published, it would need to be published by the Joint Biosecurity Centre as they own it, and I'm happy to feed back to them the committee request for that to be published. One, the R rate isn't normally part of that consideration, uh, the, but the cases per 100,000 are. However, I would say that it is quite fluctuating, especially when we are at a, a point where we're considering changing the country's status. Um, particularly if that's a removal, um, because the, the, the case rate per 100,000 can, can change drastically over a, sh a matter of days. Um, and we look at it, um, whilst we look at it generally weekly, if there's a particular concern, it will be looked at more frequently. So hopefully that addresses the queries. Thanks. Okay, um, Orlea. Um, yeah, thank you. Just to follow on from um, Jerry's point there. So the with the, the, the data sharing, um, I know that um, it was referenced in the table papers um, around that, and, and you have mentioned yourself that discussions are ongoing. But I'm just wondering, are they happening in any sort of structured fashion, um, or you know, are they happening on on a regular basis? Because obviously things can move quickly as well. Um, and just around, so obviously the the two different health systems, the PHA. I know that whenever um, they get the detail from a passenger locator form, um, if if someone has test, tested positive, then they will then make contact with their counterparts in the, the in the southern health authorities. And I'm just wondering, in that contact um, tracing process, all island, do you have any figures um, on you know how many times that that has um, occurred? Um, so that would be the, the first point just on that, firstly, please. Okay, um, so the, the conversations on data sharing. So 
Um, the, the, the challenge that we've had with data sharing until very recently is that the, the, the system in the South is paper-based, uh, so it was very difficult to share data in a meaningful way anyway with us, even if we had access to it. Um, so, and the second challenge is that those travellers into the South that are heading to Northern Ireland don't need to provide an awful lot of information on the form. Um, they can state that they're heading to Northern Ireland and they don't fill it all in then. So we are having those conversations with the South and how we get access to what's there uh, and improving the situation overall. Um, and yes, there is those, that's discussed um, at least weekly on the weekly CMO call. Um, and outside of that, there are more informal conversations that we are progressing with um, specific colleagues leading on travel in the South. Uh, in terms of figures on contact tracing, um, I will have to come back to you on that. I'm not. Uh, working in the contact tracing team and we may have to do a specific data extraction but I will confirm if those figures are available and if so we try to get them for you. That's great, thank you. And and just also you had you had touched on it there yourself. See whenever um so when people are travelling um from the south um into the north, um the, the passenger locator forms um I know again and it said in the table papers that um the the, the, the UK passenger locator form is completed online, so passengers can complete this within um, any time within 48 hours prior travelling to the north. Um, and then it also says that so the posters are, are displayed also in, in Dublin Airport. But is there any sort of like, you know, is there anyone um, outside of the posters in, in the airport? Is there any follow up on if? passengers are actually going online to complete those forms um, before they come north? No, it's very challenging until we're able to get some data sharing in place with the South to follow up with those passengers. Um, so there isn't at the moment. Um, however, if, if um, PSNI become aware through other reasons that a person isn't self-isolating, it doesn't matter if they've completed the passenger locator form or not. Okay. So the self-isolation requirement still is, is, is able to, to be enforced if, that, if needed without the form, if that makes sense. They're two standalone things. Okay, um, thanks very much. And can I just suggest, because Colm, I know that you have raised it as chair and Jerry raised it as well, around um, the, um, the issue around the specific risks in the north, um, how they're reflected in the lists of countries that are specified within the travel regulations. And I'm just conscious that we can't get clarity on it. Well, we haven't got clarity on it so far today. It wasn't provided in the department's response in the table papers. So if we could, and we did write off to the department to get it back in writing. So I think it would be useful if we could get those points um, confirmed in writing. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that and I'll work with Ian to get that, that done, that's no problem. Um, but just to provide some reassurance that we do look at the data specifically for Northern Ireland and as I say, it's actually since this morning we now will get regular reports from the contact tracing service on the cases involving travel and the countries involved. So we will be able to, to, be, to take um, our own view on that as well in terms of whether that's providing greater or lesser risk to Northern Ireland compared to other regions. Um, Whilst the, the data from is from the Joint Biosecurity uh, and they are the ones that develop the data, they do work for all four regions uh, and there is um, understandings in place between all of the four Ministers of Health um, to reflect that and Ian does review then, the Chief Scientific Advisor does review all of the data that comes through um, to ensure that he agrees with both the methodology and the results that they've come to. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Elian and Olia, and going to Alan and then Paula. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just it is disappointing, uh, Chair, to hear about the the uh, shortfalls in the data sharing uh, between the Republic of Ireland and ourselves. But I think some of us had concerns from the get go about just how it would work, uh, and I do realise that there are difficulties. But I think it's vital. Uh, that we, we get that sorted out sooner uh, rather than later. It is a, definitely a huge uh, loophole in, in our protection against the transmission of the disease. But it's just in terms, Elaine, uh, we're hearing a lot of criticism from uh, disgruntled, uh, disgruntled, disgruntled criticism from people who are caught maybe relaxing uh, on a beach uh, in an, an overseas country and finding that that country is suddenly put on the red list and that they face a period of quarantine uh, when they come home. Um, 
Can I just confirm that it is still the department's position and message that people should only undertake foreign travel that is absolutely necessary? Um, we, we really don't have a, have a sort of a position on whether people should travel if it's necessary or not. What advice we do provide is that the countries can change rapidly and we've always said this from the very start, from, the, from these were introduced in July. Uh, there is information online which says that you should plan to self-isolate when you come home regardless of whether the country that you're going to is on the, the exemption list when you leave. Uh, because there is always a risk that we will remove that country while you are there. Um, and we have always been clear on that, and we have done that, and we've moved rapidly in a, in a couple of situations over the summer um, where people wouldn't have had time to come home if that was what they wanted to do to avoid self-isolation. Um, so we don't, we don't get, in, get into the reason for travel, but we do say that if you are travelling, you should plan to self-isolate when you come home, and you should have measures in place to enable yourself to do that, and you and your family, if needed, if they've been travelling. Thank you. And Paula, finally. I was, um, thank you very much. Um, it, was, it was about the um, comments I think came out from the Chief Executive from Belfast International Airport, I think it was this week, regarding the testing of, of passengers as they get off, off the flights. I'm just wondering, is there any thought or any movement around that? Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so the current, the current advice currently still stands that the, the testing isn't at a sufficiently proven place where we could reduce the 14-day period using testing, uh, and certainly a single test wouldn't be sufficient. Um, so what we are trying to do is, across the UK, put a, a couple of different um, te uh, sort of testing um, pilots in place just to, do, to see whether or not um, a second test, so test on arrival and then at a later point, in and around perhaps seven to eight days later, uh, if two negative tests would be an effective means of reducing that 14-day period. And the other thing that we're working to try and put in place is a te as sort of a, a short-term um, survey of the prevalence amongst arriving travellers. Well, that will just be one test that those travellers will get, but it would inform us whether or not, or sort of what level of prevalence to expect in, in incoming passengers. Um, we would like to get to a position at some point in the not terribly distant future where we could reduce the 14 days um, through one to, or two, a combination of two tests, but we just don't have the evidence at this point to say that that is effective and that that is a safe thing to do. Um, and we are working to have that in place. It will probably take, I would say, another few months, um, but given the speed that we've worked at it in the previous, it wouldn't surprise me if that gets reduced over time. Um, we'll, we just have to see how the results come back. Um, just a wee follow-up, please. It was just to, to ask then, uh, are one of the Belfast or one of the um, Northern Ireland airports going to be the, in that pilot? Are you pushing yes, for that? Yes, I understand. I understand that Belfast International is involved in one of the in the survey for the second one that I mentioned. I'm not sure about whether they'll be doing, involved in any of the other ones, but I do know they're definitely involved in that one. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elaine, um, for for those responses. And um, I suppose it is it is regrettable that the letter came in so late. And I suppose it's left then that it was it was difficult just to take that all all into account. And thank you for committing to return to us with the additional information. But for now, that's that's all. And thank you for uh, attending today. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you, Chair. Okay, bye. Okay, members, um, we now have to formally consider each of the SRs in turn. Colin, I just saw your hand there now. Um, I, 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 I just, uh, we have to formally consider each of the SRs in turn. The examiner of statutory rules has reported on just two of these SRs, 138 and 140. All of these SRs are subject to negative resolution. Colin, before we went to the SRC and check, was it a question for Elaine? Your your hand hadn't been up as, at the close. Yeah, sorry, I just highlight that whenever there's a speaker in there, Elaine, both my mute button uh, was it it went dark. I wasn't able to control it, so I wasn't able to participate in that debate because you couldn't hear me or see me. But it seems to be a bit of a technical problem when the other person was on speaking. I wasn't able to control the buttons at this side, but it, it's okay. It was just a question which I can I can write and ask for an answer. It's nothing. 
Okay, and we'll ask the okay. technology to check that check that issue out. Okay, Colin, thank you. So, members, we're going to go through the uh, the SRs one by one then. So, SR twenty twenty forward slash one three eight. Can I remind members that this SR exempts persons travelling from a list of exempted countries and territories from the requirement to self isolate for fourteen days after their arrival. It adds that those involved in elite sports competitions and certain workers in the transport industry to the categories of persons exempt from the requirement to self-isolate upon return here. It also amends the exemption for healthcare workers to restrict it to healthcare workers coming to the north in order to provide healthcare. The examiner of statutory rules has reported this SR is in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content with the department's reason for that. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that rule? Jerry? Thanks, Chair. Just, just follow on from myself and, and Orlea's comments and, and questions. I mean, I do think it is bizarre, to be frank, that we're being asked to support, and you know, are effectively already in place, but um, endorse lifting restrictions on countries, and we haven't got the R rates uh, in front of us. So uh, I think there's a serious, serious question of whether the Health Committee can. Um, I, they may be obviously declining the rates, uh, but I think it is a, a major concern in terms of transparency of decisions and, and what this committee decides if we don't have these uh, figures in, in front of us. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a major concern that, that I would have, Chair. And would members be content that uh, we, we pass the rule but that we write to the department and ask them to provide us with that information in along with the information that that, that information gets provided to us to address that concern I'm happy with that chair but i just i do think it is um i know there's a, the, the deadline is approaching for the for the sr but i, I do think it is you know <laughs> a bizarre state of affairs that we're being told we have to pass and make a decision but we don't know the r rates but you know i do agree with your proposal in terms of we're right to them but i it just it's a it's a strange state of affairs that we're, we're in yeah. Um, just to advise the committee, so the the last date on which this committee can um, decide to object, because these are negative resolutions, so you have an opportunity to object, which would require a motion in the chamber before the expiry of the statutory period. So today would be the last day, following our ordinary meeting schedule, when you could agree to object and get a, bus a motion tabled in the business office if you were to object, for example, by Tuesday for the business committee to schedule it for the following week. Um, but as the chair said, this, these are the older ones that put the original framework in place, the first two that are subject to this early deadline. The later ones, um, SR 154 and 155, your last opportunity to object would be next week. Um, and but you could, otherwise, as the chair said, you could, of course, take your decision and still write to say that in, for the future you wish to have these rates provided. Yeah, I think on an ongoing basis, it's important that we have all the evidence and information that we require to make these decisions. We do understand that this, things have been done quickly in the circumstances, and, and we reckon, but I think we, we could expect and we should expect that improvements will continue to be, when, when as time allows, improvements will be built into our ability to scrutinise and, and assess all of these. So, If members are content with that, then I'll, I'll uh, put the... Uh, so I'll ask formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 138, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Regulations NA 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Moving on then to SR 2020 forward slash 140. This SR omits Serbia from the list of exempt countries in respect of the post-travel self-isolation requirements. The examiner of statutory rules has reported that this SR is in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content with the department's reason for that. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. Therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 140, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number no. Two Regulations 2020 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 154, and this is the SR that removes Spain from the list of exempt countries. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No. So therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 154, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number no. 3, <coughs> Regulations 
2020 and subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Right. Moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 156. So this SR adds the following to the list of exempt countries. Estonia, Latvia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Slovakia and Slo Slovenia. It also amends some definitions in the legislation and substitutes the list of specified competitions for the purposes of elite sports. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No. So I therefore ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 155 the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment No. 4, Regulations NA 2020, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you, Members. Moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 163. This SR removes the exemption from the requirement to self-isolate for certain health or cure professionals. It also amends the self-isolation requirements to ensure such persons could receive cure as required where they are self-isolating. It also omits Luxembourg from the exempted countries list and makes other minor amendments. Have minors any further issues to wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 163. The Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment No. 5, Regulations NA 2020, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. SR 2020 forward slash 168. This SR amends the list of countries further. It adds Brunei and Malaysia to the exempt <coughs> list, and removes Andorra, the Bahamas, and Belgium. Have members any further issues in connection with that rule? No. Then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 168, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment No. 6, Regulations 2020, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. SR 2020 forward slash 179. This SR provides that passengers will not be treated as arriving in, departing from, or transiting through a country or territory if, at all times, the passenger remains on board the vehicle in which they are travelling and are kept separate from anyone arriving on board during a stop. It also amends the review period to 28 days instead of 21 and further amends the list of specified competitions for the purposes of elite sports. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that rule? Oh, thank you. Then I, can I then ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 179, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel and Public Health Advice for Persons Travelling to NI Amendment uh, 2020 and subject to the report of Examiner of Statutory Rules has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? We agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 185. Uh, this SR adds Portugal to the list of exempt countries and territories and removes Austria, Croatia and Trinidad and Tobago from that list. Have members any further issues you wish to raise? No. Then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 185 Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel, Amendment No. 7, Regulations NA 2020, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are members agreed? And moving on to our last SR in this section, members, is SR 2020 forward slash 189. So this SR further amends the list of exempt countries. It adds Cuba and removes the Czech Republic, Jamaica and Switzerland. It also replaces the list of specified competitions for the purposes of elite sports. Have members any further issues in connection with that rule? No. no. So if not, can I ask members then to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 189, 
the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment No. 8 regulations and subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Are members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, members, and I will now propose that we suspend in order to get our next witnesses uh, on the line. Yeah. This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, so moving on then, members, and thank you. We have now, now come into our consideration of three statutory rules relating to mental health. So I refer members to tabs 15 to 17 of your pack and to the clerk's memo at tab 15.1. I can advise members that a departmental official is here today to brief the committee on these SRs, and I would now like to welcome Mr. Thomas Adele, Head of Mental Health and Capacity Unit. And Thomas, would you please go ahead and brief our committee? Yes, um, I'm going to keep this very, very short. Yes. So I'm sure you want to hear it. The first SR is the Coronavirus Act suspension order, um, which is uh, SR to suspend the mental health provisions in the Coronavirus Act. As we discussed before in this committee, um, Schedule 10 of the Coronavirus Act provided emergency provisions for the mental health order to allow the mental health order to function in times of extreme pressures. Um, as the pressures did not materialise as expected, we have therefore suspended these um, provisions. So they kept live on the statute book if we would have a second surge or future pressures. But at this point, we have suspended the use of them, so they cannot be used at the moment. Okay. Thank you. We'll continue with the next one. Straight yes. away. Yeah. Yeah. And then members can ask about each of them. Yes. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, the next SR is the Mental Health 1996 Amendment Number Two Order, which similarly um, relates to mental to coronavirus pressures. The Mental Health Order requires that continued medication. Um, in relation to detained patients, require second opinions um, with trigger point in time. Originally, that was three months. In March, we amended it to six months, again, to uh, deal with pressures uh, relating to COVID. And this order reverts those changes to six months, as promised at the time. Um, thankfully, those, as far as we know, those provisions have not been had to be used during the period, but they, they were important to be there if we were going to have a significant surge and um, unavailability of staff. The third SR is the Mental Health Nurses Guardianship Consent to Treatment and Prescribed Forms Amendment Regulations. These uh, regulations amend two forms, so form number 10 and form number 23, that's used for mental health order statutory powers. Form 10 relates to the detention, of, or the detention for treatment um, of patients. This, these amendments do not relate to coronavirus and pandemic in any way. Um, RQA last year carried out a review on the usage of this form and came to the conclusion that the way the form was set up did not lend itself to be filled out correctly, which meant that it was filled out incorrectly um, by some practitioners. And RQA then worked with professionals to co-produce new forms, a new form that would help filling it out, filling out form correctly. So it's not a question of set change of substance in the form but making sure we're asking the questions in the right way to bring out then the information that's required. So some of the changes, some of the things have swapped place and um, some questions have broken up into more than one section. That's the main change to the form. The, the, the substance of the form has not actually changed. But as to the prescribed forms, we didn't have to make um, equivalent amendments. Form 23 related to second opinions. These forms um, were originally changed back in 2015 or proposed to be changed in 2015, should I say, as a result of a judicial review, where the reason for the second opinion was not clearly stated on the form. So these, the new form uh, 23, which we have in these regulations, add a section at the end when the, the decision to provide a second opinion has been justified, to provide the clinical reasons for the second opinion. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Yes. Um, so I suppose, well, first of all, I suppose, just to generally welcome the fact that the, the department are removing these types of, of restrictions when the opportunity arises to do so and when, when the situation has changed, I suppose we all understood that we reluctantly had to kind of bring in some of these measures um, and that we did all express our views that we wanted to see them removed as soon as, as, soon as possible. So that is, 
that is welcome, and it also allows you to concentrate on the restrictions that still are necessary. So it's useful. In, it's useful in that sense. I suppose I want to just ask you: Does this mean that effectively now everything has returned in relation to mental health? Everything has returned to how it was previously within legislation, or that, are there any remaining temporary provisions still in existence? In, in terms of legislation, everything is returned in mental health. So mental capacity, which is similar but significantly different. Uh, those provisions in mental in the Coronavirus Act are still live, so that's Schedule 11. And the big reason for that is they allow remote or distance decision making, which the uh, Mental Capacity Act does not allow. So they're kept they're kept live to allow uh, video conferencing and those things in the decision making to avoid the risk of infection. Um, but in terms of mental health, all legislative provisions are brought back to normal. Okay, thank you. And um, I do note that certain certain provisions are suspended. Um, so, what's the process then in relation to if those were being, if those became necessary again when they're suspended? How are you ensuring that uh, that any lessons you've learned from how those those restrictions impacted in real life? How, how are you capturing that learning or reflecting it in any further measures? Um. We were very fortunate that the mental health order provisions were amended were, did not, were not required. They were used, I think, twice, uh, as we provided in evidence to you before. That in, indicates to us that it is possible to operate the mental health order in more difficult circumstances than we first believed. Um, and that, that's a big learning, so we're going to be far more reluctant to introduce these changes again, if you have to. Um, we, have, we obviously all have learned a lot during this period, so we're trying to get better information on what's happening on the ground. We're trying to get better data collection so we can make informed decisions um, that's based on hard data rather than discussions. Because obviously we need both, but we also need the data. The process to bring this back, it will require another um, statutory rule or statutory, um, another order to bring them back. So that's, not, not, that's something we would do very reluctantly. And it's something we'd have to come, um, come up here for scrutiny as well, of course. We would not want to do it lightly, and we hope that with the learning we've had, we can avoid that. We would have to have a very, very severe second search for us even to consider bringing it back. I think I can say very confidently. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. I'm going to go across now to members and um, Pam. Yeah, thank you. I, think, I think, Thomas, you've actually answered my question. I was wanting to ask whether. Um, the SRs there have the capacity to deal with exceptional circumstances um, going forward, um, or if the emergency changes would still be required if for, uh, future waves of coronavirus required it. So I think what you're saying is if it, if it was severe enough, you, you may consider, but you'd be reluctant to consider bringing yeah. those forward again? Yeah, I mean, the, the mental health order is very prescriptive. So unless we follow statutory provisions, we can't carry out certain, certain acts. And especially when it comes to the tension of patients, if you come to a point where the health professionals are, just aren't available, we don't want to be in a place where we cannot detain people, because that could cause significant harm to those patients and others as well. So it's that, it's that balance of, of the risks. Um, we, we, one of the big learnings is that we can prioritise in mental health services to make sure that these areas we require the right people have the right people available. Um, but if you come to a point where they just aren't available, we must make some provisions to allow people who need treatment to get treatment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, in relation to SR 2020-146, Sir Thomas, and you've made the point that those are not related to COVID-19 or coronavirus, they changed the forms, and that was uh, flagged up in relation. Uh, that was flagged up by RQIA as as an issue. What other table did you consult other stakeholders around those changes then on the back of RQIA areas, or how did you arrive at that? At that uh, decision? Yeah, sure. Um, and RKA was the one who did the review, and they did it collaboratively with the trusts and the board, PHA, and professionals. Um, this was middle of last year, towards the end of last year. We, there was then a number of workshops and similar events where all people who are involved in filling out these forms were involved. Because the key, especially on Form 10, was not to change the contents in the forms, but make sure that professionals wrote the right things on the forms. So they didn't miss. Basically, they missed half a question very regularly, which is obviously not good practice. Um, so when RK examined the patient's notes, the information was there. It was just not brought out on the forms. Um, we had these things ready to be put forward in February and March, 
But then because of COVID, we obviously didn't. So th there was a significant process back then to, to um, co-produce the forms as the SNO is. So professionals, especially psychiatrists who would be the one filling out the form, um, have been involved in the process at all, at all stages. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I suppose it, it is welcome that they weren't, weren't needed to be used very much. But I suppose the other thing that more broadly around all of these restrictions and regulations is that potentially looking forward to what might happen in the future, where areas have become clearly identified as, as problematic in the event of a major pandemic and creating problems for some of our most vulnerable people, that departments would now be looking at how we could sort of for, forestall that in the future, how are we set up at the minute, and how would that impact if there was any future waves of this or indeed other pandemics. So I think that's something that, that should be considered in the, in the fullness of time as, time as time goes on. I will just check in with Colin there, just in light of the problems there. Colin, have you any questions for Thomas in this section? Are you okay? Not hearing from Colin there at the minute. So, no other questions from members then for Thomas. Okay, Thomas, thank you very much for attending today and thank you. we appreciate your input. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you. Um, so, we now, as previously, need to consider each of those SRs individually. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on any of these SRs, and these are all subject to negative resolution. So, first of all, SR 2020-141, which is the one that suspends the amendments relating to the Mental Health Order 86, found in the Coronavirus Act 2020, Section 10 and Schedule 10. So, have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? No. I can then ask members for, to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 141, the Coronavirus Act 2020, Suspension Order 2020, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, SR 2020 forward slash 142. This SR is, related, is a related reversal of coronavirus measures. It, it varied from six months to three months, the length of the period triggering a requirement for a second opinion for the continued administration of medicine to detain patients. Have members any further issues to wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No. So if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the mm. Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 142, the Mental Health 1986 order, Amendment number two, order NA 2020, and subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Members agree. Thank you. SR 2020 forward slash 146, then. This SR, as discussed, substitutes two statutory forms, Form 10 and 23, for the purposes of decisions made under the Mental Health <coughs> Order 1986. Form 10 relates to detention for treatment. The changes make the form clearer as to the requirements needed to detain a person for treatment, but do not change the requirements for detention for treatment. The changes to Form 23 make explicit the requirements as to the type of medical practitioner required to give a second opinion in normal and exceptional circumstances. So have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No, members. So if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 146, the Mental Health Nurses Guardianship Consent to Treatment and Prescribed Forms Amendment Regulations 2020, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Moving on then, members, um, the next batch of SRs relate to restrictions. Um, and we may need to take a short break just to ensure that we get our next officials on the line. So we'll take another short break there to get that organised. Thank you. The Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the nine. Yep. So. Members, the next batch of SRs relate to restrictions. Um, and I refer members to tabs 18 to 23 of the pack and to the clerk's memo at tab 
I can advise members that departmental officials are here to brief the committee on these SRs and are joining us by video conference today so that we can maintain the social distancing within the room here. So I'd like to now welcome Mr Nigel McMahon, Chief Environmental Health Officer, and Ms Liz Redmond, Director of Population Health. So could you please, Nigel and Liz, please go ahead and brief the meeting this, this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, I'm going to leave the brief introduction, if that's okay. Mm. Oh, we're getting some noisy feedback at our end, but um, we're, we're here. We're hearing you clearly here. There's no feedback on the sense, so we are hearing you clearly, Nigel. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the health protection coronavirus regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, were made and brought into operation on the 28th of March. The need for the restrictions and the requirements imposed by the regulations were required to be reviewed at least every 21 days. The committee will be aware that it's a requirement of the principal regulations that as soon as the Department of Health considers that any restrictions or requirements set out in the regulations are no longer required to prevent, protect against, control or provide a public health response to the incidence of, incident of, the, incidence of the spread of coronavirus in Northern Ireland, then they should be withdrawn. Just to remind the committee in terms of the process, and proposals for change to the regulations are brought forward by departments and they're considered as part of an agreed executive decision-making framework that includes guiding principles, a risk and benefit assessment model and a structured process for assessing and implementing, modifying or withdrawing specific restrictions and requirements. The decisions to introduce, withdraw or amend existing restrictions or requirements have been implemented through amendments to the regulations public messaging and guidance. Today, uh, the committee is considering the coronavirus restrictions number two regulations as amended and the coronavirus wearing of face coverings regulations as amended. If the chair is content, um, I propose to summarize each of the statutory rules before the committee today, after which um, Liz and I would be happy to take any questions the committee may have. Yes, content with that, Nigel. Go ahead, please. Um, so, beginning with SR 2020, number 150, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number 2 regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The number 2 regulations were made on the 23rd of July and were commenced at 11pm on the 23rd of July. The number 2 regulations revoke and replace the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020 including all of the previous amendments that were made to those regulations. The restructured regulations require the closure of certain businesses, services and premises that are listed in the schedule, except for limited permitted uses. The regulations impose restrictions on gatherings, both indoor and outdoor, of more than 30 people, which are not permitted to take place, except for gatherings organised or operated for cultural, entertainment, recreational, outdoor sports, social, community, educational, work, legal, religious or political purposes where the organiser or operator of the gathering undertakes a risk assessment and complies with relevant guidance to limit virus transmission. The regulations also impose restrictions on gatherings in private dwellings which outdoors were to be of no more than 30 people and indoors were to be no more than 10 people from no more than four different households. Any restriction on people staying overnight in a dwelling other than their own was discontinued. The regulations are required to be reviewed every 28 days with the first review taking place by the 21st of August. The regulations are due to expire after six months, which would take us to January 2021. SR 2020, number 151, the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The face covering regulations were made on the 23rd of July and were commenced at 11pm on the 23rd of July. The regulations require members of the public, subject to limited exceptions, to wear a face covering on public transport. 
The regulations are required to be reviewed within six months. Uh, that's by January 2021. And the regulations are due to expire after 12 months, which brings us to July 2021. SR 2020, number 164, the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The face covering amendment regulations were made on the 31st of July and were commenced on the 10th of August by way of a commencement order made on the 7th of August. The face coverings amendment regulations require members of the public, subject to limited exceptions, to wear a face covering whilst in an inside relevant place, including in a shop or a shopping centre. SR 2020, number 170, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number two, Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The number two amendment regulations were made on the 7th of August. The changes that they introduce have uh, different commencement dates. And the two main changes that were introduced are to allow a theatre or a concert hall to be used, but solely for a rehearsal or live recording, in both cases without an audience, from the 8th of August, and to permit sports in indoor arenas not capable of seating 5,000 or more spectators from the 10th of August. SR 2020, number 187, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number two, Amendment, number two, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The number two, amendment number two regulations were made at 5.45 p.m. on the 25th of August and came into operation uh, immediately on being made. In summary, the main changes introduced are to reduce the maximum number who can participate in an indoor or outdoor gathering, not in a private dwelling, from 30 people to 15 people, with some exceptions. To reduce the maximum number who can participate in an outdoor gathering at a private dwelling from 30 people to 15 people. To reduce the maximum number who can participate in an indoor gathering in a private dwelling from 10 people from four households to six people from two households. To permit up to 10 people to attend a wedding or a civil partnership ceremony indoors in a private dwelling where one of the participants is terminally ill And the restrictions on gatherings and the restrictions in relation to private dwellings are not to apply to a funeral or a wake. However, those involved must comply with guidance issued by the Department of Health. Uh, Thank you for listening, uh, uh, members, and agreeing to take these uh, statutory rules at your meeting today. And Liz and I would be happy now to try to answer any questions that members may have. Okay. Thank you, Nigel. And I suppose I'll start out with one that I had asked Lane earlier, but actually it was more relevant to yourself in relation to um, SR 2020-150, the, the, the more general one. And there's a wide list that you, you read out the list to us there of cultural entertainment, recreational, outdoor sports, etc. A very wide list. What, what type of activities fall outside of that list, I'm wondering, given its extent? Okay, Chair. Um, as we've said, the, the number two regulations revoke and replace the existing regulations. In bringing forward the number two regulations, which are structured in a different way, we needed to be very careful to make sure that all of the relaxations and previous uh, um, decisions of the executive were properly reflected in the new, new restructured regulations. So the list um, is an attempt to organise and simplify the types and categories of event and gatherings that uh, could and indeed arguably should be allowed to continue um, and that were uh, permitted as a result of previous executive decisions. So it's a series of categories. You recall in the original regulations we had, we had a growing and long list of types of events and gatherings that were allowed to go ahead. So it was an attempt to capture all of those um, uh, the, the, that were permitted by way of previous decisions. Probably what's more key in terms of the types of events that now uh, shouldn't go ahead is the second part of that section, which uh, requires that if the gathering is to be more than 15, then there should be a responsible person or an organiser, and that person should be responsible for carrying out um, a risk assessment 
uh, and if the risk assessment identifies that suitable measures are required, that those measures are put in place. So in terms of things that shouldn't go ahead, it's really those that are um, would involve more than 15 people where those requirements haven't been met. Okay, thank you. Second one from me is in relation to the general kind of um, frustration, I think, that, that, that is out there in terms of keeping up with all of the different things, and I recognise that's, that's, that's a difficult area to try to um, all the various changes that are being brought in one after each other, and, and, and some of them, while necessary, they can be confusing at the same time. Just a couple of examples, people would say to you, you know, how come I can go for a meal to a restaurant at, at particular times? How come I can go for a meal to a restaurant but not to my parents' house when that was, when that was the case? And I do understand that you know the rationale to that is that you touch many more surfaces when you're in in uh, in that type of home setting than you would. But do you recognise that there's a need to communicate better with the public in terms of what the rationale around these various decisions are, so that the public can understand why they're being taken? Another issue that, is, that has arisen quite widely is around soft play and how some soft play areas can be deemed not able to be opened, but other soft, like trampoline, or there's other activities very similar, but yet those are, those are allowed to open. So is there an issue here with communicating clearly what the restrictions are, but also very clearly and openly what the rationale for that restriction is? Okay, thank you. Um... Well, you will know that the restrictions, there's a requirement to keep the strict restrictions under constant review, and indeed the executive uh, do that almost on a, a daily basis. Um, you'll also be aware that that's very much informed by the scientific advice from Chief Scientific Advisor and Chief Medical Officer in relation to that. So, um, whilst they accept that there have been a lot of changes, uh, and there may well be a lot more, um, that's an attempt, obviously, to respond to the situation that we find ourselves in at any particular um, moment in time. Um, following uh, uh, any announcements then, sorry, following any, any changes, there are then the press releases and announcements that are made to communicate what those are. And when departments bring forward proposed changes in their particular sector that might require uh, engagement with that sector or guidance, then typically that happens in, in parallel, so that guidance is made available. Um, the communications element is, is challenging because of the pace of change and the, the, the range of change. However, there have been some moves to try and improve that. So, for example, um, the Executive Office have done a piece of work in, in trying to pull all the guidance from all the various departments together, uh, including from our own, into one, uh, onto one page on the NI Direct uh, website so that all the guidance is available um, in one place. Um, in respect of, of soft, your question on soft play areas, um, soft play is obviously one of a relatively small number now of uh, uh, premises that are required to stay uh, closed. Uh, and, and the executive ministers are very, very conscious of, of the need not to have any restrictions in, in place any longer than is necessary. So they are all subject to review and there are ongoing discussions with the various uh, um, sectors. Um, including in, including soft play, so we have discussed before. I think you know that um, making specific changes do, do create or potentially appear to create some anomalies across the piece. Um, but in restructuring the regulations the way that we have, hopefully then um, changes will be more easily made in in the future. Um, on the specific comment about um, apparent anomalies, like you can meet family members in a, in a restaurant, for example, but not necessarily at home depending on numbers. Um, I think that those sorts of changes try to acknowledge that in certain types of business premises that are still allowed to open, they can only open and, and conduct their business if they follow the departmental guidance and if they have measures in place to ensure social distancing and to ensure that people can visit those premises and, and avail of the services safely. Um, the same is not necessarily true in the home setting. And certainly I understand that the scientific advice is suggesting that um, the epidemiology around the number of increased number of cases uh, is certainly in part being driven to a large extent by um, gatherings within personal homes rather than people being outside of the home. And I think the, the different treatment of those two settings um, in the regulations reflects that position. 
Yeah, and, and, that, and that's, the, that's the piece I'm trying to get to, is communicating that out is, is a key part of, of building the understanding and getting public support, you know, that the, so that the public understand that's why, that's not arbitrary, it's based on a rationale, and I think that's important that that rationale is, is communicated. Finally, for me then, before I go to members, is... I notice within Article 8 there's a, there's a reference to being labelled on summary conviction for a fine not exceeding level 5 on the standard scale, and there's also the fixed penalty notice. So in what circumstances are each of those used? You know, what's the difference in those two approaches? Um, that's largely an enforcement matter for, for PSNI. It essentially gives them a number of options depending on the nature of the uh, offence and the context in the situation. So in most cases, you would imagine that uh, issuing a fixed penalty notice um, uh, on the spot to, to, to an individual, for example, might be the appropriate way forward. I should also say, of course, that, that um, police approach is to, is to uh, encourage and advise in the first instance rather than revert to, to penalties. But should they feel the need to do that, then fixed penalty is an option. Um, the, fine, the, the fine is available on summary conviction, so that would be uh, if the offence appeared to be serious enough at the time that police felt they would wish to go straight away to prosecution, uh, or indeed if a fixed penalty notice uh, were not to be paid within the time scale, then, um, then they could revert to, to prosecution through the magistrate's court for that, and then the fine would come into play at that stage. And uh, have proceedings been issued in in that in court proceedings? At this point? I'm not aware that they have, Chair. But if, if you if you want an answer on that, we would have to go back and check with with PSNI on that. But uh, I'm not aware that there have been any any court proceedings thus far. And do you know how many fines would have, on the spot fines would have been issued at this point? Um, we could certainly get that for the committee. Um, PS and I do update on that from time to time, but we don't, I don't have the most um, recent number available to me at the moment. OK, thank you, Nigel, for me. I'm going to go to members now. I'm going to go to Deputy Chair Pam Cameron first, and then, and then I'm then going to go to Colin McGrath on the, on the phone, and then I'll come back to members in the room. Yep. Um. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Nigel, for your uh, attendance today again. I wanted to ask you in a round... Um, why it's deemed appropriate um, to allow exemptions for funerals and wakes above the 15 person limit when a few months ago all gatherings were treated on the same basis. And I suppose what I'm getting up to is, you know, is this about buying to political pressure um, on the back of the, the story funeral or does the departmental guidance still place a reasonable limit on the number of people attending or does the department Departmental guidance, does it um, actually prescribe a limit on these events at all? Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're all very well aware of um, the sensitivities around uh, funerals, um, in particular, the need for sort of dis dignity and respect when dealing with the, the, the deceased and the family and all that goes with funerals and the different aspects of funerals. I mean, there's no doubt it's been a very challenging issue. Um, in relation to where we are with funerals now and, and what we have done to, in effect, lift funerals out of the regulations, um, was really a result around the, the most recent changes that uh, have occurred as a result of the increasing cases. Uh, we mentioned the... Um, amendment to the number two regulations that has reduced the numbers that are allowed to gather to um, six people from two households indoors um, and reduced from 30 to 15 outdoors. In parallel to that, um, the department had been engaged with the various stakeholders, primarily funeral directors and councils and others, in revising the funeral guidance and a lot of hard work had gone on to agree um, a position uh, with all the various stakeholders in relation to that guidance, which includes numbers for the various aspects of funerals as well, um, that at this point in time are deemed to be uh, acceptable to be permitted. And there was a danger that as the executive um, attempted to respond to the rise in number of cases, 
and changed uh, the numbers that would apply to gatherings uh, in other settings, either in family homes or outdoors, that there might be an unintended consequence uh, in that uh, they, they then might conflict with the, uh, um, with the agreement that had been reached amongst the various stakeholders about uh, how funerals might best be conducted. And the decision uh, in policy terms then was, is there a way that we can separate uh, out what has been agreed over, over quite a long and intensive period of discussions with the various stakeholders around funerals from what's happening and other changes that might come in the coming days and weeks around other types of gathering. So what we have in effect done is said, um, the other restrictions don't apply to funerals. However, those involved must comply with the departmental guidance, uh, in effect, uh, making that statutory guidance. But yes, the, uh, whilst uh, I'm not familiar with the full detail of the guidance, um, I am aware that it does include uh, numbers which are now different from the numbers in the number two regulations. Okay, and uh, just on the, on the back of that question, Nigel, um, we're coming up to Halloween, Christmas. Uh, there's going to be, you know, obviously a huge desire for families to get together in some way at those times. Um, do you think that discretion um, may be given, um, you know, on the back of risk assessments um, for? gatherings of those sorts to take place? Well, what I can really say to that is that uh, it's something that we're cognizant of and something that obviously falls to the executive to, to consider. So I think um, uh, the, the upcoming sort of holidays and events will be something that will be very much in the forefront of the mind whenever uh, executive members are asked to consider um, uh, any future changes in terms of numberings around gatherings. Thank you. So I'm going then uh, over on the phones to Colin McGrath. Colin, are you there? Thank you very much, Chair. And um, just a very quick question, um, and thank you to Nigel for the update there. And it's really about the issue of wearing masks, where we define um, indoor spaces, and that it's kind of always listed as just including um, shops and shopping centres. But is there maybe just a wee bit more a definition of what inside space is, because people are saying they have to wear it if they're visiting people in their homes, they have to wear them, um, you know, if they're, you know, obviously in churches where I think it is accepted, but, you know, it is inside defined as everywhere that is indoors unless it's in a home. Right, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I think we probably need to distinguish between what's in the regulations and what is a strong advice um, around this. So the regulations only mandate the use of face coverage in very specific situations. So public transport, which came into effect in July, on the 10th of July, and then we added to that um, in August, 10th of August, it came into effect, the uh, wearing of face coverings in shops and shopping centres and things that you can think of as retail of, of goods or services. And there are exemptions to that, which are listed in the, in the schedule. Um, the whole issue around any other indoor space is really um, discretionary, but covered by strong advice and guidance, which says that if you are in an indoor space, any indoor space, and you can't maintain social distancing from people who are not from your own household, then it's strongly advised to wear a face covering. So I hope that makes the distinction clear for you. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and personally, I would advocate that everybody should be wearing them at, at all opportunities, but it's just to clarify what the regulation was about it. But that's great, Terry. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm conscious, um, Paula, maybe I'll go to you first. Okay. Later. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm just looking at the um, indoor gatherings um, of up to um, six households, and I'm thinking specifically about the students returning into the Holy Lands. And apologies, I keep sounding like a broken record on this area, but. A lot of the HMOs in that area would have bedrooms up to eight or nine in each unit. So effectively, the young people are arriving, and many of them already settled in, from eight or nine different households across the country into one household. And I'm just wondering, is there any, going to be any specific regulations in relation to those? And if not, um, is there going to be any specific departmental guidance um, produced 
because there is still a lot of confusion out there, in, especially amongst the local residents and the universities, obviously, and how they manage it. Um, and I just want to pay tribute to the police who this week have started going in and, and enforcing the, the regulations around the house parties and stuff, which is mo most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would start by saying that the police are part of a um, working group set up by the executive office looking at the university issue. Um, so there has been a, um, a group of interested parties involved in discussions around that. In relation to the, the, um, the regulations, themselves. Um, there are no proposals at present to do anything particular uh, or, or, or different or make any changes specifically in relation to university accommodation. Um, as things stand in terms of the numbers of households, the regulations refer to um, uh, the, the address at which you are resident. So student accommodation is not really treated any differently in the sense that if you had, say, for example, a house that was being rented by six students, then uh, once they take up resident, they, residence for the, the period of time that they're, they're uh, studying or they're at their course, then effectively that becomes their household, so they become collectively a household. If you have a house that's been converted, say, into three or four flats, uh, each flat will, will have a different address, and therefore each, each flat uh, is then treated as a household. Um, so in terms of gatherings um, and allowing people into house, it, student accommodation should not be treated any differently from uh, any other residential type accommodation or any main resident residents. Sorry. Um, sorry, just to come back on that. I think with all due respect, they should be, being, be treated differently because we know at the weekends they do go home, play sports, mingle in their communities and come back again. So in many ways, that's my point that I think that this, this, there's particular circumstances in this area and Stranmillis and others, but then has that wider community transmission potential across the country. Uh, um, so I, I would like you to reflect on that. I think the second part is about this working group looking at, at the student accommodation and, and the work with the universities um, and encourage you to engage with some of the residents and groups in those areas who will be able to provide you with a lot of very specific feedback in, in terms of how things are happening at the minute. So, and I, I would appreciate if you could keep me updated on the work of that working group as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go on now to Alex. Thank you. Um, just in terms of um, face masks, um, when we're talking about um, wearing face masks for the public when they're going into shops, does that include the staff of the shops? Is my first question. The second question is um, the limited um, exceptions in face masks. What exactly are those? And I know obviously chest conditions and stuff like that, but can we get a list or be told what those exactly all are? And finally, in terms of enforcement, um, the PSNI seem to be the, the ones to do the enforcement. Um, but if you're, you're going into a shop, like um, a garage that I was in today, at least half of them weren't wearing face masks. When are we likely to see that being robustly enforced? Because it, it's really not fair on those who are, are making the effort and those who aren't. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll take those. Um, simple answer to your first question is that um, staff in the shops are not required um, in the law to wear a face covering. Um, that doesn't mean that the employers uh, might not, they might do their own health and safety assessment and in fact decide that that is something that staff should do, but it isn't required um, in, the, in the law. Um, the second question was around the list of exemptions. Um, now, that's very deliberately not specific because there is a very, there are a very large number of reasons why somebody may not be able to wear a face covering and we didn't think it was appropriate to set out that list because we could never be exhaustive about it. Um, so regulation five does set out the general categories where an exemption could apply and it's very much a, a, a self-declaration if you like. We're not requiring people to have medical certificates or any other evidence um, around why they are, are unable to, to do uh, a, a face to wear a face covering. Um, the 
last of your points around enforcement, um, you're correct, it's the PSNI um, who can enforce the wearing of face coverings in shops. Um, we, at, the, at this time, my understanding is that there haven't been any fixed penalty notices issued and there's very much an approach being taken around encouragement. Um, I, I don't think there's an appetite for, for getting out there and getting into shops and, and, and slapping fixed penalty notices on people, but um, clearly it is a concern if there's certain parts of the retail sector where the compliance is low, and that is something that will be monitored very carefully and, and further action taken if, um, if, it, if it doesn't improve. I, I understand it's not even across the retail sector and um, the sorts of situations that you've just described, garages are one of the areas that has been highlighted as, as having a lower level of compliance. Yeah, um, so we are aware of that. Yeah. Chair, is it okay if I just go back to the, the, the limited uh, reasons? Um, am I reading you right? There's no specific list. Um, because you've it's felt that that could be quite substantial. So does that not give somebody a get out clause that they don't have to wear it because they suffer from diabetes or something like that, or something that maybe they should still have to wear one? Is, is that not giving people an excuse because they feel because of some condition they may have? that they shouldn't have to wear it? Is it sort of not leaving it like a free-for-all, really? Well, I, I mean, it. I can see the point you're making, but I think the if we adopted a very prescriptive approach, we'd end up with a, a greater difficulty, in fact. Um, so I, I think we have to... Um, give people a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here that they are making a judgment about their own circumstances. And I know that in certain retail settings, the compliance is actually very high. So um, it is the case that um, uh, the advice that we've received is that ideally we'd like or need 80% of people in those settings to be wearing face coverings in order to limit the transmission significantly. And that is what we are um, aiming for. Um, so it, it is a, a difficult area. I, I accept the point you're making, but we feel that being prescriptive is actually going to be more difficult than not being prescriptive. Um, I, I just feel that it's basically anyone can make an excuse and they'll not have to wear a face mask. That, that's basically what you're saying, and it, and it is. It, it, it's not. That's that's just anyone can make an excuse. Like I, I could not wear a face mask and be pulled on it and make the excuse that I'm short-sighted, and it's not on the list because there isn't a list, and that could be a genuine reason. And there's nothing anyone can do to enforce that. So I really do think you need to rethink about what you're saying because it's basically from what I'm hearing, it's if somebody thinks they've got an excuse, they can get away without wearing a face mask. And that's what I'm reading from what you're saying. So okay. I think you need to look at that again. Thank you, Alex. Um, going down to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nigel. There's um, a couple of questions here that I'll be quick as I can. Um, I think it's SR 150 around the risk assessments. Um, can you just give a bit more detail about how that process works and is it uh, in tandem with the uh, PHA or the department? Um, I, I mean, some of the stuff seems sensible, obviously, about reducing the amount of people gathering from, from 30 uh, to 15. Uh, but to me, the, the glaring issue uh, appears to be schools, where um, a lot of cases up to 30 people can be crammed in the in the classes uh, with some of the biggest classes uh, in Europe, and we've seen uh, at least 67 schools with cases. So it seems to be there's a sensible move in terms of reducing numbers of gatherings um, indoors, but there's a big gaping uh, hole around schools. So a comment on that, please, um, and also. Um, uh, what assurances can we get um, uh, around the opening of events, uh, given the Minister's uh, comments, I believe it was yesterday, around the need to uh, maintain uh, 
essential contact only. Um, there's obviously restrictions being lifted here around cinemas, banquet halls, you know, extracurricular activity that people normally in a normal time should be able to engage in. But how is that uh, weighed against being essential contact? What is the assessment around that? And I'd be concerned we're being asked to support these uh, restrictions being lifted in a time when the department or the minister or possibly the executive uh, seems to be maybe moving in a in a perspective around uh, maintaining a uh, limiting contact to essential uh, reasons. And just finally on the mask. I mean, I think it's obviously essential, and I support the the, the, the regulation. Uh, but I think it, it would be remiss not to mention, and others have referred to it. Uh, I think last week there's been a big increase in anti-mask um, nonsense, to be frank, uh, and conspiracies. Uh, and I think that needs to be tackled. I think uh, it didn't help that there was, I think, a slowness on masks. There was uh, backtracking. There was confusion from, from uh, if not the department, then sort of elements of the executive. But I think there needs to be. Um, from the department's perspective, a real public uh, health message campaign to tackle those myths, to dispel them uh, in an accessible way so that we can, can protect people, save people's lives. And I think it's, it, it is worrying to see that increase uh, in the anti mask um, point. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yep. Go ahead, Nigel. Okay, um, Jerry, I'll maybe, maybe kick off with the, the first couple of points there, and then maybe Liz come back on the mask. Mm -hmm. Questions at the end. Um, in terms of the risk assessments, the well, the, the the change in thirty to fifteen. Effectively, what that's done is reduce the threshold for the, for the requirement for those. So obviously, there are more types of events now that will require risk assessment as a result of that change. The regulations refer to um, risk assessments in line with the Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations. I think that's primarily because. Um, risk assessments is something ordinarily we would associate more with risks in the workplace and there's established guidance and process there. So it doesn't require you to actually comply with those regulations as such. It's, it's basically pointing in the direction of those and the guidance associated with those um, to assist you with doing it. Um, our own departmental um, guidance on the regulations um, attempt to give some guidance as to the main elements of what would be involved uh, in a risk assessment. Um, and in basic, in basic terms, I suppose it's fairly, it's fairly logical. It's, it's, it's having a look at the nature of the event uh, or the gathering that's involved, and that could be anything from a church service to a much larger outdoor gathering, trying to identify where the risks of virus transmission might uh, occur and then putting in place reasonable measures to address those. And we all know there's a whole range of them from hand washing to one way systems and signage and a whole range of things that can possibly be done. Um, the Health and Safety Executive Northern Ireland website uh, also publishes uh, a template for um, risk assessments for COVID-19, which could be used by any business or, or the organizer of any event. So hopefully there is some sort of support and guidance out there. What I would say is um, the lengths you have to go to and the detail, I think, will very much depend on the nature of the event. So uh, let's say, for example, uh, uh, in your own committee room room there, uh, I mean, presumably somebody has had a look at that and has determined that, you know, the main that the, uh, the, the main risk is around sort of social distancing and that sort of thing in the room and you will have been given advice about how the room set up and that sort of thing. So although you're meeting regularly, that risk assessment was presumably only, only had to be done once at the beginning and any future meetings that you have uh, in, in your room or indeed uh, uh, in our own premises here um, uh, wouldn't require that to be revisited until unless there was some material change in the way you were conducting your meetings. So we're, we're not attempting to place a large burden on people having to do these things, of course, unless it's a, a much larger, more complex event. What I, what I, where the value comes, I think, is that it, it causes people to at least think about these things, that um, it, it requires them to think about what are the risks, can we safely carry on with this event, are there measures we can put in place to mitigate those risks. Um, the regulations do not currently require that that risk assessment is signed off or, or uh, in any way by any other organisation, and that's simply down to the fact that 
I don't think any of the organisations that would have expertise here, whether it's councils or health and safety executive, could be put in a position where they're expected to, uh, to assess and sign off um, risk assessment for every individual event. So uh, uh, I would accept there are some limitations around that, but I think it's probably a step in the right direction in terms of um, uh, uh, making people uh, think about doing the right thing and to put uh, measures in place. Um, in relation to um, events carrying on and the potential conflict in messaging with uh, um, essential gatherings and essential events, in some ways I think that links back to the point on risk assessments, that those larger events and those things that are now permitted to, to carry on or, or to happen can only happen where that sort of risk assessment has been carried out, uh, out where there is a recognised organiser and where measures have been put in place. Um, and again, we made the comparison earlier on between that and, and maybe in the home or the private setting where um, those sorts of requirements um, don't apply. So um, I think the, the, the logic or the thinking around um, keeping society open, uh, keeping um, controlled social contact happening in the context of risk assessment and measures um, still fits with the messaging around not doing things that are um, uh, are unnecessary or, or outside the requirements of the regulations. Um, I don't really feel I can say very much on the schools issue. Obviously, schools schools policy is for the Department of Education, um, and uh, you'll be aware that there, you know, has been development of guidance for schools around that, which has involved advice again from um, the Chief Scientific Advisor and Chief Medical Officer from this department. Um, so I'm not really in a position, I think, to comment on the details around. Um, measures that have been put in place in schools, other, other than to say that it has been in, done in conjunction with discussions with this department. Um, I'm happy to take any follow-up on that, or do you want Liz, Liz to finish off on the masks issues first? Yeah, well, I appreciate the answer, but I don't think it grapples with the discrepancy in the, in the regulations, to be frank, but you know, happy to take a, an answer on the, uh, the masks from, from Liz. Okay. Moving on to Liz then. I, yeah, um, no, I, I actually do greatly appreciate the point being made and it's a constant struggle, uh, I think, to get our message across uh, loud and clear. And I think it does link as well with um, the Chair's comments earlier on um, about needing to be clear about the rationale. Um, so uh, there is a, a campaign already ongoing around face coverings. Um, and we note your points um, about the need to counter some of this um, uh, anti-movement, um, and we'll take that away. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Just a, a quick point and, and a related point to Jerry is around the schools. There are also growing concerns around school transport. Do you, do you remain in contact with, and I know that's more education and infrastructure potentially in terms of transport, but do you continue to keep an eye on that and engage with them if, if concerns are, are continuing in that area? Uh, well, again, it's, it's probably not, not our lead, but we would always make ourselves available to engage in conversations about topics such as that, because we, we do take that very seriously. So um, I think neither Nigel or I are directly involved in conversations on this subject, but I, I am aware that they are ongoing. Yeah, well, I, I suppose I would just like to urge that, that all, all three, like your, all three departments are relevant in that, that, because that issue needs addressed mm -hmm. fairly, fairly quickly. I'm hearing a lot, of, a lot of issues arising on school transport. Thank you. Going to Alan and then Arlea. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just, I'm thinking there uh, in relation to enforcement, you know, it, it really is unfair uh, to expect the PSNI to enforce the, 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 fa the, the, the face mask uh, rules. Uh, I mean, they, they have their hands filled just uh, with, with ordinary law and order. Um, and, I, you know, if you're going to walk into a shop and there's somebody not wearing a mask, you're going to have to have a conversation with them as to why they're not wearing a mask and they might be exempt and they're going to have to explain it and the police officer then has to listen to that. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's such a practical thing to expect the police to do this and I'm wondering if, if there was issues of enforcement. Uh, I know that some of the enforcement uh, issues over other regulations have been filtered down to say local government 
uh, who might have more manpower uh, to, uh, to you know to, to maybe have those conversations around shops and shopping centres. My experience, my family is in retail, and my experience at the moment is that there's probably about a 90% uh, compliance uh, with uh, face masks. And the reality is, uh, Alec was talking there about uh, you, you know exemptions and, and, and people, if they want to be clever, actually I think one of the exemptions is just if, if wearing a mask makes you anxious. Uh, so how do, you, how do you argue with somebody over, over that if they say wearing a mask makes them anxious? I think that it's down to if suddenly, for whatever reason, so, somebody suddenly announced that MLAs don't have to wear seatbelts, I doubt if there's anybody in this room that would start not uh, wearing their seatbelt because we know it makes sense uh, and it saves their lives. I think it's the same with exemptions. My experience in my family business is that people who I would know would fall into one of the exempt categories, people who have come out of maybe serious illnesses, people that have had breathing difficulties, and I've witnessed it over the years, they're actually the people who are wearing masks, uh, that they're foregoing their exemption because they know that they're the most vulnerable, and they don't want to catch, they don't want to catch this virus. So in fact, they are, they are complying. I find the people that are not complying are, and, and this is just going to take a change of habit, is workmen coming off a work site, running into the shop to get a, a quite a quick bite to eat at lunchtime, and they're forgetting about a mask. People get into a garage, and Alec referenced it, get into a garage, petrol station, to pay for your petrol. Uh, on more than one occasion, I've had to run back from the door back to my car to, to, to retrieve my mask, because you just, you just forget. Uh, but we're all on that learning curve, and I think it will become second nature. And I think that... We'll get back to the old thing here about, and I think it's been the same with a lot of the regulations that we've been seeing coming through the system over the last lot of months. You've got the letter of the law and you've got the spirit of the law. And I think that the, you know, we are depending on the public uh, respecting uh, the spirit of the law. And I think most people get that. And I think that everybody who wears a mask uh, has got to be made to realise that they are making a contribution to curtailing uh, the spread of this uh, uh, coronavirus. Um, so I think really just continue, I think we just need to continue um, advertising uh, and getting forward uh, the message. Petrol stations could maybe put a little notice on their petrol pump just to remind you that you know, if you're going to pay for your petrol, please wear a mask. Just different things like that, I think, could uh, could could assist uh, uh, educating the public. Thank you, Alan and Arlea. Yes, thank you. And just briefly to follow on, because I know mo most of the members have touched on the issue of the face coverings um, within the regulations, and I'm just wondering, does does that um, incorporate the face? Shields and visors as well. Are they? Do they come under the regulations? Because I'm just conscious, um, particularly with some of the staff in some of the shops and in the restaurants and stuff. Um, you can see the the shields. I'm certainly starting to see see more of them um, out out in the public. So, and then there's also I've heard some um, some different perspectives around you know, you, the shields aren't as protective as as the the face masks if you cough or if you sneeze. So I'm just wondering, do they fall under this this regulation around under the bracket of face coverings? Right, uh, they don't. In fact, uh, they're not covered. Um, some of what you're seeing in shops, I guess, is a, a, a pragmatic um, sort of middle ground that the owners of the premises uh, and employers are taking um, because their staff aren't required to wear face coverings, as um, as I've mentioned earlier. So, um, they, but strictly speaking, they are not covered. Uh, they they don't they're not considered to be a face covering in the context of these regulations. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Liz and Nigel. Um, I suppose we have we have addressed a lot of a lot of the issues there, and I agree with a lot of what's been said in terms of and, and we do ask that the department communicates clearly and all of those things. But I also do want to endorse what members have said here in terms of we all have an individual responsibility 
particularly at this time, as there are worrying signs out there of an increase in the virus. And I would appeal to everyone out there to do everything they can, right up through all those simple steps of washing hands, socially distancing where possible, um, and wearing a mask. So um, thank you very much for coming today to the committee, and uh, we'll, we'll now give the OCRs further consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Uh, thank you for that. So we now need to consider each of those SRs individually. Can I advise members that the examiner of statutory rules has reported on SRs 139, 150, 151 and 187 and has no issues to raise. All these SRs are subject to the confirmatory procedure. So SR 2020 forward slash 150 revokes and replaces the original regulations and amendments providing a more streamlined set of restrictions rather than exceptions. It requires the closure of certain businesses, <coughs> services and premises listed in the schedule and sets out restrictions on indoor and outdoor gatherings as well as providing for offences and penalties. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No, and if not then, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 150, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Regulations 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Right. SR 2020 forward slash 139. This SR, deferred by the Committee at the last meeting, was one of the SRs revoked and replaced by SR 2020 150 including a, it, it added to the list of premises and services able to reopen, including cinemas, bingo halls, etc., and had eased restrictions on gatherings and events. Have members any further issues to Mr. to raise in relation? Jerry? Thanks, Chair. I kind of alluded to it um, there uh, with Nigel, but um, I just do think it, it is you know, confusion, at least, that um, some, you know, there's easing of restrictions in terms of some of these uh, areas. Uh, but there's been a re reduction in the amount of people that can meet uh, indoors in terms of uh, two families, I think it is, um, and six people indoors. So, um, uh, and also there, there may there may be sort of further announcements uh, today by the minister or the executive. So, uh, I don't know if it's if it's ways or, or correct or or the best uh, course of action to you know support this restriction if there's questions uh, around it. Or possible other amendments, so just a bit of guidance on that would be helpful. Yeah. Just, just to remind members, this is the one you, you really, the chair, would be just putting to you in a moment to, to note that it's been revoked, really, rather than this is one of the, the whole suite of provisions that was replaced by the one you've just agreed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, agreeing to 150 then effectively revokes 139, and uh, I do think there was an acknowledgement. I think that um, that that needs to be better considered by the department, I think, in, in relation to that. So was that what their name was revoked, sorry, Chair? Okay. Um, isn't that yeah, so that yes. Okay. Thanks. Any other issues? So then can I ask members then to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR twenty twenty forward slash one three nine, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, Amendment number eleven, regulations NA twenty twenty and is content that it be revoked by SR 2020 forward slash 150. Great. Great. Thank you. Moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 151. This SR makes provision for the compulsory use of face coverings in specified situations. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? No. Uh, if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 151, the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Regulations 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Great. Thank you. SR 2020 forward slash 164. This SR makes amendments relating to the use of face coverings, including adding to the list of situations in which they are compulsory. Have members any further issues wish to raise in relation to that? No. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 164, 
the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Regulations 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Agreed. Thank you, Members. SR 2020-170. This SR provides for sports to take place in arenas seating fewer than 5,000 spectators and allows the use of theatres for rehearsals or live recordings without an audience. Have members any other issues with that SR? No? So then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020-170, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Regulations, NA 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. SR 2020 forward slash 187. This SR reduces the numbers permitted to gather indoors or outdoors in various settings and makes provision for funerals, wakes and weddings where one person is terminally ill. Have members any other issues they wish to raise in connection with that rule? No. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 187, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 2, Regulations 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, members. Um, and now take, take, take your, your thoughts and maybe it may be worthwhile now taking maybe a 30 minute break. We do have a lot of correspondence to deal with today. Would members be content to take a 30 minute break to grab some lunch and come back in 30 minutes? I'll need to leave early then, sorry Chair, because I have a public accounts committee at two, so I mightn't be able to stay until the end. Okay, well, so could we agree to be back for a quarter to two then? And, and Okay, members content, thank you. Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you, members. Now we are turning to correspondence. And can I refer you to tab 24 of your pack and table papers and to the correspondence memo at tab 24.1? So there's a few items there that I want to just draw members' attention to. Um, item 24.2 is from the Minister providing a, a copy of the draft storage planning framework. Is there any comments from members on that? Um, I, I suppose, from my own point of view, I'd want to get a, a sort of a better look at it. But um, I think for me, it's important that, that the planning is done in a way that recognises accessibility for, for all areas. And I think particularly those where, where you may need recovery for coronavirus, I think we want to be careful where we position those so that maybe elderly relatives or curers are able to to access them reasonably well. But um, are members content to note that for now, pending further scrutiny, as, as we will undoubtedly, undoubtedly want to do? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Item 24.3 there is a response from the Chief Nursing Officer to issues raised at the briefing on the 23rd of July. Um, would members, I suppose, and I think you will join me in welcoming confirmation that a business case has been accepted for development of a COVID-19 life assurance scheme and with the, uh, the stated engagement with unions on that, on the, on that matter. Now, in, in my own view, and I, I do welcome that, and I think that's all, all very to be welcomed. One concern that I would have, and it's not overly clear in the briefing, but I would have a concern that there may be a knock-on impact on benefits of the recipients of this money. And I, I think I would like to seek a bit further clarity as to what steps the department have taken or are taken to ensure that no one will lose out on, on the one hand as a result of receiving that. So I wonder would members agree that we right to seek some clarity on that particular issue? Yep. And is there any other um, issues in relation to that the members want to um, raise? And then in terms of the rapid learning initiative, would members be content that we seek an oral briefing at some stage from the Chief Nursing Officer Charlotte McCardle on that rapid learning initiative and in connection with, with our own work on that subject of care homes? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, members. Item 24.4 then is from the DALO outlining the department's proposed approach to engagement with the committee on EU exit transition period statutory instruments. Members will be aware, of course, that we can request additional briefing if we feel it necessary, notwithstanding the framework, this framework. So 
Any comments on that, members? Um, there is a reference there. There is a reference there within that to um, an approved. Let me just see if I have a note of it. To an approved system for statutory instruments, and I was just wondering where that where that approval was given. Um, but maybe what I will do is maybe I'll have a look at it, Chair, and we can, we can bring it back. But it just was it was a bit unclear to me as to the approval, and the, these are going to be very very fundamental issues and very issues that we need to to I think exercise a good de degree of care and diligence on those issues. So um, there was something that had uh, stood out to me in terms of the approval for the system, but we can come back to that. But for now, are members content with the? Uh, are members content with the approach that we can receive additional briefings if we feel it necessary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, members are content. Item 24.5 is a response from the Chief Social Worker to issues raised at the briefing on the 25th of June, including copies of guidance issued to care homes during the course of the pandemic. Um, any comments on that? Extensive uh, submission from the Chief Social Worker members? Yes, Jerry? Sure, just, just briefly, just... Um are we scheduled to get the chief social worker in again? I presume it will probably form part of our um, work on the care homes, but uh, do we have any plan to get to get them in again? Do we? We have no fixed date at this stage, but I think you're right, Jerry. It will be a key a key component of ours. So I think we will be certainly within within that time frame looking to to speak with the chief social worker again. Okay. So um, are members then content to note that pending the further scrutiny that we've discussed there of the care homes issues? Yeah. Thank you. Item 24.8 is from the Society of Occupational Medicine regarding access to occupational health service for all employees, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, and seeking engagement with the committee on that matter. Um, do members have any thoughts on that matter, or any issues they want to raise or discuss in relation to that? Um, well, in, in light of that, and I think, and I actually recently have, have been um, engaged by someone from Occupational Health in terms of pressures on, on the system, but would members be intent to engage individually and to request a, a written briefing from the society, a, a written briefing on that subject so we can explore further and then decide how we might proceed then, given all the other things that we're engaged in at the present time? Yeah, yeah members happy with that. Thank you. Item 24.12 is a link forwarded by an individual to an article about serious issues around GPs in the North feeling bullied into COVID centres. Um, uh, and there are, there's also a further correspondence issue down, down the, the line, but we have already discussed there, and, and I suppose we can do it now, it might uh, preempt what we're going to do later in the correspondence, but I think there are a significant pressure in terms of GP services, and I think it would be useful at this point to speak with the Royal College of GPs and maybe the, the BMA. I'm wondering in terms of just speed of response and in terms of not overly taking away from the other work, if, if members will consider maybe myself and Pam setting up something by way of Zoom, and members would be quite open to, to come along to that, but that we would engage maybe and I'm thinking maybe on one of the sitting days next week that we try to slot it in, just because it's, there's so much press and issues, and I think we need to hear from them in relation to what the difficulties are, what their plans are to improve the opening of services and one thing or another. Would members be content rather than setting up a full formal session that we do a Zoom meeting with the two groups to take, to take views in relation to that letter, but also in relation to the more, the more uh, the pressures on, on GP services and the difficulties getting appointments? That I mentioned it. Will members be content with that? Yeah, yeah I think um, I would be content with that um, as long as obviously it's open to everybody else uh, that wants to attend. Uh, I think there are real issues going forward. I think it's apparent with the the NE seem to be chock a block, uh, and that's a worry that, that people are trying to up to NE because they are not getting access to their GP or they are not finding it easy to get access GP services. So I think that is. I think it is an issue, and there, there, are, there are lots of considerations. I think going forward into the winter months as well. Yeah. Uh, I know certainly our own GP service. Um, even if you're attending the nurse, you actually queue outside. Um, you know, when you're sick and needing treatment, it's it's far from ideal. So I think we would need to hear from um, your how they're planning um, to get us through the winter months. Yeah. In particular. 
Yeah, and, and there are also other appointments which are critically time limited, such as the one I mentioned earlier, and, and many of them. So, and I, I'm, what I am suggesting is, at a minimum, we would want absolutely all members to be to be invited to attend and attend if possible. Alan, yeah, I think it would be useful to uh, to get an update from them because I'm not really sure whether. There's actually an appetite among GPs at the moment to throw their doors open or whether they, they feel fearful uh, about opening the doors to the public. Uh, so, you, you know, it would be nice to know where the, the, where the push is coming from to maintain the, the, the current sort of system. And the other thing it's, that's going to come into the equation, and it, it, logistically, I know uh, I read some sort of reassuring remarks last week about it, about how it all fall into place, but... Logistically, I think the uh, the flu vaccine is going to be a major challenge this year to doctors. I mean, in the past, you'll have all went to get your vaccine, and it's there's maybe 400 people in the health centre all elbow to elbow and queuing up and, and waiting to get an injection like a production line. And I don't think they're going to be able to recreate anything like that. They're talking about church halls and leisure centres and, and all the rest of it, but that is going to present major uh, logistical challenges. So I uh, think, yeah, but very useful to hear from the GPs at the moment. Okay. Yeah, plus, uh, I suppose there's also the uh, pharmacy to take into consideration too, because when when people can't get into GPs, they go to any and they go to and they go to pharmacists. So that the knock-on pressure goes elsewhere, and we understand why the GPs are being cautious too, because they want to maintain their service and they're, they're worried about infection actually closing that or actually losing losing service and having doctors having to isolate and whatnot, so you don't want that either. So that's like there's a, a, a balance to be struck, but it would be good to have that and to be able to flesh out those issues with yeah. them directly. Just, Orlea, could I just impose on you one, one minute? I'm going to, I'm going to, so that's, that's agreed. We'll set up that Zoom meeting with the GPs to discuss that issue and, and those other issues. There's one other issue just before, while, while we still have you there, Orlea. We have received a, a correspondence from an individual regarding an invoice for our son's cannabis-based medicine. Um, this is, um, and and we, we have met and we understand how difficult and how protracted that case has been. But he requires us to treat his epilepsy and requesting an informal meeting tomorrow with committee members. And she has also requested a meeting with the minister. So I'm conscious that the committee have to say that we cannot engage in individual cases. And therefore, but but I do recognise that there is actually a wider issue around the area of a uh, CBMP products for work for people with it. So I would be proposing, if members would be content, that we write to the department, um, and and uh, expressing that concern and asking asking them in relation to the situation with those cannabinoid products and also that members will individually engage with that person as they as may suit themselves as they as they may be able to jerry sure just uh, for your benefit uh, content? um i'm content but sorry i need to go over and get it from the next minute sorry guys no problem so we lose quorum we're losing quorum earlier uh, just can you we'll, we'll lose the quorum for the decision if you just okay. if you can just give us a wee second <laughs> okay quick cool. as i can ahead, over there. I uh, don't want to keep you. Um, just for your benefit, benefit Chair, just uh, if, if we can, last week I said that we should forward any correspondence from the individual to the department. So I think there's been a, um, a, a number of, uh, number of sorry, uh, comments and correspondence uh, in the last week. So just that we continue to do that, to forward it on to the department, the neighbours, um, um, designed to take care of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, content, members content with that as well to forward the correspondence. Yeah, I was also going to suggest that. Also going to suggest that. There's, there's two things that we get to bring up, two things. Orlea, sorry, Orlea. Just there's there. two other small things the clerk's still my attention to. It's just two decisions that we need because we can't take it. Which one is this? Yeah, Okay, so uh, item 24.16 is from an individual who's waiting for hernia surgery in the Belfast Trust, and item 24.27 is from an individual who's waiting for origin surgery for endometriosis, also in the Belfast Trust. Would members be content to note pending our next session on rebuilding services and advise those individuals of that approach that we're going to bring this into that into that session? Content. Members content with that, thank you. QUB 24.25. 24.25 then. 
24.25. That, uh, yeah, it's, it's significant. This is from Queen's University regarding additional funding needed for medical school places to accommodate 70 applicants who, due to the reissue of A-level grades, and we all remember that, now meet the terms of their offer. Items 24.33 and 24.36 are from individual students who have been affected by the, by the issue. So I uh, would members agree that every effort should be made to accommodate those students as soon as possible? And would we be content that we write to the Health Minister and the Minister for Finance to express the view and that, that we are hopeful that they can be facilitated and that to, we would then advise the individual students of that decision? That we're going to write to both? Yes, Jerry? Sure, yeah, I, mean, I would agree with that. Um, I've been contacted by a lot myself, but would economy as well be yeah. relevant because the, yeah. the university places I'm not sure if that's the general cap or just the cap for the course, but the economy minister as well. But yeah, I think we've all been contacted, and given the need to strengthen our NHS, I think more medical students generally is a, is a, is a good thing. Okay. Okay, is that the. Or no. yes, sorry. No. Right <laughs> <laughs> the window. <laughs> okay, members, so I'm now going to revert back to our running order. Um, so, uh, members, uh, so moving on then to item 24.15 is from a professor at Stirling University who is seeking the committee's support for a research project on COVID-19 and Four Nations public health governance so that it might record this on its application for funding. Have members any comments or would members be content to write to the professor confirming that the committee would be interested in the potential findings of such research? Sorry, Chair, we've lost quorum. We're not in a position to take decisions, I'm afraid. Okay. We, just, we could suspend Deferred. the meeting and see if we can track down another member to come Deferred. back. Can we defer that decision, okay. Chair? Well, what, we, what we'll do is we'll suspend because we are, potentially there's another member. So we'll suspend for a few moments and just to check the situation. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.